Yo, what is going on, Fantasy Addicts? I'm your host, That Fantasy Addict, and today we're going to be doing another mock draft. This time it's 12 team PPR mock draft from the third overall pick. We are doing this mock draft on Sleeper.app. They have a mobile app and a desktop website. They're both phenomenal. I like both of them. I'm not being sponsored to say this or anything, but I do really believe that they are the best out there. The website and app are both very user friendly. I really like how it looks and it just definitely is the best out there. Their ADPs for mock drafts are more accurate than pretty much every website out there. While these ADPs are not the most accurate that they could be, they are definitely more accurate than all of the other competitors because these other websites have rookies ranked extremely low. Sleeper does a pretty good job updating their ADPs and everything. So I do feel like this is the best way to draft, not only have your regular leagues on, but also just do mock drafts. Once again, not being paid to say that, I just really believe that Sleeper is the best way to host your leagues and to do your drafts and mock drafts. So with that being said, I'll give you a link to this website in the description below, and let's get right into the draft. All right, so Christian McCaffrey goes, followed by Alvin Kamara. So that is a little bit of a twist because normally it goes CMC and then Saquon. But just like in real drafts where there's people who don't adhere to regular ADPs going around, neither does this mock draft because that's more realistic than just having them following exactly what the ADP says, especially because if that were the case, when you're doing your mock drafts, you could just see exactly who's going to go where and know exactly who to take because, oh, I want player A and player B, but player B is going to be available at my next pick, so I'm going to take player A. You can't do that, and that's what's going to happen in regular drafts. You're not going to know exactly who's going to go where, and that's the same thing in these drafts, which is why I really like them. I do think Sleeper does a good job at having their CPUs kind of mix up what they do and not completely adhere to the ADPs that they have. So obviously here it's between Zeke and Saquon Barkley, but there's a new coaching staff in Dallas. Mike McCarthy's there who has not really liked to run the ball historically. Now he's never had a running back as good as Zeke, but nonetheless, he always did like to utilize the passing game a lot more than the running game. So even though I think Zeke will be completely fine, that tiny bit of risk is more than any risk that Saquon Barkley has. The only risk really is his high ankle sprain that he had last season, but that's never an injury that really lingers onto a whole nother season. So I expect Saquon to be very safe. He's on an offense that should be better now that Daniel Jones has a little more experience. And there still are some solid pieces on this offense, like Darius Slayton, like Golden Tate, like Sterling Shepard, like what should be an improved offensive line. So I think Saquon is phenomenal. He's a tremendous player, and I think he should do fine in New York this season. So we are going to go with him. And then after we take him, Zeke goes, no surprise there, followed by Joe Mixon. Devontae Adams goes ahead of Michael Thomas. Then Dalvin Cook, Derrick Henry, Michael Thomas, Nick Chubb, Tyreek Hill, Julio, Austin Eckler, Miles Sanders, Patrick Mahomes, DeAndre Hopkins, Kenyon Drake falls a little more than he usually does, and same with Josh Jacobs, Travis Kelsey goes, Aaron Jones goes, and Todd Gurley goes extremely early. I do not like taking him at all, especially in the second round, considering that there are a lot of injury concerns about him, not to mention he's in a new offense, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. So this is a pretty standard late first round and second round. Devontae Adams went ahead of Michael Thomas, which doesn't usually happen, but it still could happen in your draft for sure. It's not super out of the ordinary. Kenyon Drake and Josh Jacobs fell a little bit, but once again, not every real draft is going to go exactly how you think it is. Austin Eckler went a little earlier than normal, but that could easily happen in a real draft for sure. So looking at the players that we have available, the running backs who I like here are CEH and at that top tier, like in that in that range of who usually goes in the second round, that's about all I like. I don't like Fournette. 
I don't like Melvin Gordon. I don't like David Johnson. Those guys usually go in the third round, but I don't like them at all. I do like Le'Veon Bell and Chris Carson. Not as much as I like CEH, but they are guys who I would like to target in the third and fourth round if they fall. They don't always fall there, but sometimes they do. Looking at wide receiver, Chris Godwin is there, who I absolutely love. He's a slot receiver. Julian Edelman was a slot receiver. Chris Godwin has a phenomenal catch rate, and Julian Edelman always had a great catch rate. Chris Godwin is phenomenal in yards after catch. Edelman was always above average in that category as well. Chris Godwin is the same player as Edelman, but just more talented. I don't see how Tom Brady couldn't do incredibly with Chris Godwin as his number one wide receiver. I really think that Chris Godwin is going to get a ton of targets from Tom Brady. Chris Godwin is going to remind him of Julian Edelman, but just a better, younger version of Julian Edelman. So I think he's a great pick. Looking at tight end, obviously Kittle is the only one worth taking here, but at the late second round, I don't think Kittle is worth it just because you can wait until the 13th round to get guys like Dallas Goddard, Jaseki. Those guys are so much more valuable 10 rounds after Kittle goes. So we're going to pass on him. And really at this point, it's between CEH and Godwin. The thing is, I'm not sure if Le'Veon Bell or Chris Carson will fall to me in the fourth round because I'm not sure I want to use an early third round pick on them. What I would rather do is take CEH here and then Chris Godwin probably will go before my third round pick. But if he doesn't, then I will gladly take him. And Kittle also might not go by my third round pick. And if he's there, I think that is worth taking just because he has so much upside and a solid floor as well. So there's still a ton of value that I can get in the fourth and fifth round at wide receiver. And there's a ton of value that I can get at tight end in the 10th, 11th, 12th round. But I can't say the same thing about running back. So I am going to take CEH right here. Lamar Jackson goes, Chris Godwin goes, Fournette goes, and Kittle gets taken right before my pick. I really wanted either Chris Godwin or George Kittle, but their ADPs certainly are ahead of the 303, so we should expect that to happen. But you never know. There's always a chance that they don't go. So it is now our third round pick, and obviously at tight end, the best player there is Mark Andrews, who is not worth an early third round pick. At wide receiver, Mike Evans is there, and while he certainly will not be the wide receiver one on this team, he still is on a Tom Brady-led offense, so I think that he's not a bad pick at all. Kenny Galladay, Adam Thielen, and Juju are also all very good picks, and at running back, Le'Veon Bell and Chris Carson will probably be taken by my next pick, so if we want one of them, we have to reach and take them now. Looking at the running backs that should be available by my next pick, we have David Montgomery might be there, and then Singletary, Mark Ingram, those guys should be there. But the only guy who I even like out of that group is David Montgomery, and ideally I would like a better RB3 it sounds like almost greedy to say that because David Montgomery is being drafted as an RB2 and I have him as a mid RB2 in my rankings. I like him versus his ADP, but I do like just stacking up on running backs early and I like to get as many RB1s and mid to high RB2s that I can get on my roster, especially because they are worth a lot when it comes to trading. So even though I like Mike Evans, I like Kenny Galladay, I like Thielen, I like Juju. Looking at what receivers should be there by my fourth round pick, I can say with confidence that one of DJ Moore or Calvin Ridley will be there. And there's about a 50% chance that I can get one with my fourth round pick and one with my fifth round pick. And I have both of them inside my top 12 wide receiver rankings. And if you want to see those, let me know in the comments below because I don't know if you guys like want to see mock drafts more, if you guys want to see 
sleeper videos or if you guys want to see like my rankings videos so if you do let me know do you want to see my rankings my running backs quarterbacks wide receivers tight ends all that kind of stuff but anyway i do think that there's a good chance that i could get both of them who i have as wide receiver ones almost as good as Thielen and juju and mike evans and those guys and there are other guys like robert woods who i'd also be very satisfied with so I'm not going to go with the receiver there because the guys who I can get in my four, in the fourth and fifth round are pretty much just as good as the guys right here. You can't say the same thing about running backs. So for that reason, it's between Le'Veon Bell and Chris Carson for me. I took a rather risky running back with my last pick, CEH. There are some unknowns with what's going to happen with his 2020 season. We don't even know if he's going to be good. We've never seen him play at the NFL level. So the thing is, the two other running backs who I'm thinking about, Le'Veon Bell and Chris Carson, are both kind of just as safe and risky as each other, I feel like. So this is really a toss-up right here. But Chris Carson doesn't have a ton of competition. Yes, Carlos Hyde is there, who might take a few goal line carries. But Pete Carroll loves Chris Carson. And really... Carlos Hyde is kind of just there to play the Rashad Penny role in a way, except I don't even think Carlos Hyde is as good as Rashad Penny is at all. And if you didn't know Rashad Penny, basically he tore his ACL late into last season, so he's barely going to be available this upcoming season for the Seahawks. So they just took Carlos Hyde to really be the backup to Chris Carson. He's on a one-year deal with the Seahawks. They're not going to keep him in 2021 because they're going to have Rashad Penny. So clearly, they just want to use him as a backup on the goal line. Maybe they'll give him some carries, but everywhere else, Chris Carson is a phenomenal player. He's on a much better situation than Le'Veon Bell is. And I feel like there's really less competition for Chris Carson than Le'Veon Bell. So for that reason, we are going to go with Chris Carson with our early third round pick. Then David Johnson goes followed by Juju, Adam Thielen, Kenny Galladay, Mike Evans, four wide receivers taken in a row, then Melvin Gordon, James Conner, OBJ, David Montgomery, Calvin Ridley, Allen Robinson, AJ Brown, Le'Veon Bell goes pretty late, DJ Moore, Amari Cooper, Jonathan Taylor, Robert Woods, and Cooper Cup go. So those were the three receivers right there. Robert Woods, Calvin Ridley, and DJ Moore, who I thought at least one of them for sure would be available by my next pick. Because if you look at their ADPs, there pretty much is a 50% chance that they'll all be there. So I was expecting at least one of them to be there, but they weren't. But I'm going to use this situation that went pretty much the worst possible way that it could have to prove to you that even when you don't take receivers early, it is absolutely okay. The three receivers who I really wanted, Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, Robert Woods, all of them got taken before their ADPs suggest that they would be taken, but it's all gonna be okay, and I'm gonna show you why. So, looking at the tight end position, Mark Andrews is there. Now, we do have to think about that, there certainly is a good chance that he could be available by our next pick because Team 2, I don't know what to call him, so I'm just going to call him Team 2, the second overall pick player, he already has a tight end. So it really comes down to the team with the first overall pick if he's going to take Mark Andrews. And there's a good chance that he doesn't take him, I'm pretty sure. But there are a lot of other receivers who I like here. DK Metcalf, like him. Keenan Allen, very safe, like him. Lockett, like him. DJ Shark, like him. Terry McLaurin's there, I love him. I like him more than pretty much every other wide receiver I just said. And he might be available by my sixth round pick, actually. So he might even be worth just waiting on, but I don't wanna really take that risk. So I'm not sure about that, but we'll at least wait until our next pick because He'll definitely be there. So now we really have to decide, do we want to take Mark Andrews and then a wide receiver and have to wait until our next pick 
after our fifth round pick. So basically wait until our sixth round pick to take a wide receiver. Looking at the wide receivers who should be there, Marquise Brown and Devontae Parker should be there. And Michael Gallup, Deontay Johnson, Tyler Boyd all should be there. So you know what? Normally, I probably would take DK Metcalf here and then take McLaurin with my next pick or maybe take Shark and hope that McLaurin falls to my next pick. But I am going to use this opportunity to try the wide receiver zero strategy. I was doing a mock draft just on my own, going in and planning on trying the wide receiver zero strategy. I talked about that on Twitter, by the way. If you want to check that conversation out, then go click the link in the description below. That'll bring you to my Twitter and you can go look for that conversation that I had publicly there. But yeah, I planned on doing a mock draft just on my own, going wide receiver zero, but it didn't fall through because there was just too much value elsewhere. But right here, even though I normally would go with DK Metcalf, I'm going to use this opportunity to show you that wide receiver zero is a viable strategy. Now, never plan on going wide receiver zero. It's only something that the, if the value is there, why not take it? And I don't quite think that the value is here, but this is about as close as we're going to get. So I want to take this opportunity right here to try out wide receiver zero and show you guys what's going to happen. So we're going to take Mark Andrews, who was phenomenal last year, and he played less than 50% of the team's snaps. He should play more for sure. He's on an offense that I expect to pass it a little more than they did last year. And Mark Andrews is pretty much unguardable. He's a big and pretty fast tight end. So we're going to go with Mark Andrews here. And let's just see what wide receivers are available at our next pick. So DK Metcalf goes. No worries at all right there. The next best receivers available are Keenan Allen, Shark, and McLaurin, in my opinion. Now, I would like to wait and hope that McLaurin falls to my next pick. If I was doing a regular draft and I had, let's say, three running backs and a wide receiver or two running backs and two wide receivers, I'd be willing to take someone and wait and just hope that McLaurin falls because I already have one or two wide receivers that if I don't get McLaurin, it's okay. But I have zero wide receivers. That's the zero wide receiver strategy. Most people consider it going four rounds without taking a wide receiver. So we're at our fifth round pick and this is our first wide receiver. If I wait and hope that McLaurin makes it and he doesn't, then we kind of are screwed. I won't exactly say screwed because there are some other pretty good receivers available, but it would be very unfortunate. So looking at the other receivers, yeah, I still like Shark and I still like Keenan Allen, but in my opinion, Terry McLaurin is just better than all of them. He is, I'll have to check, but I think he's inside my top 15 wide receiver rankings. And I just love him so much. He looked phenomenal last year. He was a top 10 wide receiver last year. Just watching them, not from a fantasy perspective, but just watching them, he was top 10 for sure. And this offense was awful, yet they ran the 28th most passing plays. They are definitely going to run more plays this upcoming season. And I just love Terry McLaurin. So we are going to go with McLaurin with our fifth round pick. It is a reach comparing it to his ADP for sure. But at this point, we do need a solid receiver and I trust him more than any other receiver that we have that or that is available. So after McLaurin, Mark Ingram goes, Raheem Mostert, Cortland Sutton, Keenan Allen, Tyler Lockett, Kareem Hunt, Cam Akers, Zach Ertz, DJ Chark, DeAndre Swift, Michelle, Darren Waller, Dak Prescott, Marquise Brown, Stephon Diggs, Darius Geis, AJ Green, and Russell Wilson all go. Now, it is our next pick, and we are probably going to go with two wide receivers here because even though I like Terry McLaurin, obviously our running backs are a lot better than my wide receivers, so we're going to go with two wide receivers here probably unless there's value at running back. And 
I like Ronald Jones, but he's just not worth a late sixth or early seventh round pick when we need wide receivers more than running backs for sure. So wide receivers available who I like. Devontae Parker, Michael Gallup, Deontay Johnson, Tyler Boyd, Julian Edelman. And I like Marvin Jones with our eighth round or a ninth round pick for sure. We'll probably take him if he's available. But looking at the guys available right now that I'd be interested in taking, I think Tyler Boyd and Deontay Johnson will be there with our next pick. So for me, it's between Devontae Parker and Michael Gallup. But the thing is, I don't really think Devontae Parker is that much better, if any better, than Deontay Johnson or especially Tyler Boyd. So I don't really care if we don't get him. But at the same time, I still probably would prefer him than guys like Deontay Johnson or Tyler Boyd because I feel like his role is more secure than the other guys. Now, I would rather have Michael Gallup than Devontae Parker for sure, but Michael Gallup should be there at our next pick. Now, Debo Samuel is also there, but he just got injured, so we don't really know what's going to happen with that. I did an entire breakdown on him and what his injuries impact is not only on him, but also on the rest of any fantasy relevant 49ers players. So after this video, definitely watch that video. I'll leave a link in the description below. But yeah, I like Devontae Parker more than those other guys who I listed, except for Michael Gallup, but Gallup should be there with our next pick. So we'll go with Devontae Parker here. He's a risky wide receiver too, but that's kind of what's going to happen when you go wide receiver zero. And I'd much rather have risky wide receivers than risky running backs, that's for sure. So like I said, with our next pick, Michael Gallup is there. He was phenomenal last year, just watching him. I don't really get his ADP. It quite honestly doesn't make any sense. His ADP is really going around the wide receiver 30 to wide receiver 35. It kind of depends on the website, but pretty much everywhere he's going in between the wide receiver 30 to wide receiver 35 in PPR scoring. And the reason I don't get that is they bring in Mike McCarthy, who will probably be more pass friendly than Jason Garrett was. And if we look at how good Michael Gallup was last season, he was the wide receiver 22 as a second year wide receiver on a team that had a head coach who certainly liked to run the ball. Now, he did like to pass it as well, but no more than Mike McCarthy likes to pass. Now, they bring in C.D. Lamb, who I think is great, but there is no reason why C.D. Lamb is going to be any bit of a threat to Michael Gallup when Michael Gallup is going into his third year and C.D. Lamb is a rookie. Not to mention, Jason Witten is gone. Randall Cobb is gone. So there is certainly room for C.D. Lamb to get his targets here. There's no doubt about it. Michael Gallup should get more targets than he did last year. And even if he doesn't, even if he gets this, even if he gets less targets, let's say he gets less targets, that's because CeeDee Lamb's there, right? So we can say with confidence that if CeeDee Lamb being there gives Michael Gallup less targets, that means that CeeDee Lamb is probably better than anyone else who they had last year that's no longer there, right? So if anything, Michael Gallup would get less attention from defenses, right? And even if he doesn't, let's say he gets less targets, but the same amount of defense, which that just doesn't make any sense, but let's just say that happens. Well, guess what? He was still the wide receiver 22 last year. And yes, with less targets, he'll definitely go down a little bit, but maybe by two or three spots. And then you add in the fact that he's a third year wide receiver which historically, a third year wide receiver is when they take the biggest leap in production. From the second to third year is when they absolutely break out. So his efficiency should certainly outweigh any decrease in targets, although he's definitely gonna have more targets, but let's just say that he has less targets. His increase in efficiency is gonna outweigh that. But even if it doesn't, even if he has less targets, with the same amount of defense, with the same efficiency, which just doesn't make sense. That's never going to happen. But let's just say it does. 
okay, he was a wide receiver 22 last season, then maybe now he's a wide receiver 25 or 26. Well, he's going as around the wide receiver 30 to wide receiver 35. There is absolutely no way that he doesn't return value. And what I think a reasonable projection for him is, is not even that much of an increase in targets, maybe 120 targets, that's not a ton. And with just a 62% catch rate, which is not great, brings him to 74 and a half catches. Let's just say 74 for 16 yards per reception, certainly doable for him. He'll probably get more than that, but let's just say 16 yards per reception. That brings him at 1,184 yards. If we add that to his 74 receptions, that's 192 fantasy points right there. Then you add in, let's say, seven touchdowns. That's a very reasonable projection. That's 234 fantasy points. That is almost 15 PPR fantasy points per game. That is a very solid wide receiver too right there. There is no way Michael Gallup doesn't return value, and he has the potential to be a high-end wide receiver too. So give me Michael Gallup all day, any day. After him, Evan Ingram and Tyler Higby go back-to-back. Deshaun Watson, Damian Williams, Jarvis Landry, Hayden Hurst also goes, along with Evan Ingram and Tyler Higby a few picks earlier. Jerry Judy goes, Tom Brady and Drew Brees, the elite historic quarterbacks go back-to-back followed by J.K. Dobbins, Marlon Mack, Jordan Howard, Ronald Jones. All four running backs go all in a row, followed by Deontay Johnson and Tyler Boyd, Alexander Madison, Aaron Jones, and Emmanuel Sanders go. So we are left with a few options. Looking at running back, I do like James White as a pretty safe player. And looking at our running backs, they certainly have a ton of upside, but... Chris Carson still does have a little bit of risk just from his injury history. CEH is a rookie. That's a little risky right there. So James White's security being on an offense that is going to rely on running backs more than ever this season is something that I might want to have on my roster. Even though Jarrett Siddham probably won't be as good as Tom Brady was the past few seasons, he is a similar player in just terms of play style. He likes to throw short routes. He likes to throw screens, especially to the running back. He loves targeting his running backs and throwing short routes. And James White is there to do exactly that. Looking at receiver, we can say the same thing about Julian Edelman, right? Tom Brady loved throwing to him because he runs shorter routes. Same thing with Jarrett Stidham. He'll like to throw to Julian Edelman because he runs shorter routes. But I also like Darius Slayton and I like Marvin Jones. I also like CeeDee Lamb if I didn't already take Michael Gallup, but I took Michael Gallup, so I'm not going to take CeeDee Lamb ahead of guys like Marvin Jones. But I love Marvin Jones, and he'll be there with my next pick. So let's take James White with this pick right here to be a safe running back, and as an RB4, I'm very happy with that. So we're going to take him, and then Will Fuller goes, Matt Breida, Julian Edelman, and Philip Lindsay all go. No worries, because the guy who I wanted is Marvin Jones. He has been very, very good when Stafford and Galladay are on the field. Marvin Jones would obviously be good without Kenny Galladay too, but even with Kenny Galladay on the field, they are both great. They are a very, very solid wide receiver one, wide receiver two combo. And if you look at the numbers when they're both on the field together, Marvin Jones is competing neck and neck with Kenny Galladay in terms of fantasy points. Seriously, Kenny Galladay is not outscoring Marvin Jones by that much. And you're spending a second or third round pick on Kenny Galladay, but you're getting Marvin Jones in the ninth or 10th round in pretty much every draft. I absolutely love that ADP. Then after that, quite a few more quarterbacks go. Matt Ryan, Josh Allen, Wentz, Baker, and Stafford all go. I don't have many concerns with Stafford. He has went through so much as a quarterback. There is no injury that is going to hinder his production. He is a warrior. He has went through so much, and he just always comes back. And he's one of the most underrated quarterbacks that there is. 
He was absolutely on fire before he got injured last season, but I doubt that this injury, unless it gets re-aggravated, I doubt that it's going to affect him that much. San Francisco defense goes, just as Buffalo defense goes. That's about where they're going normally, but I'm not a fan of taking a defense that early. It's just not something that I ever want to do. Then besides that, the players who are available, I like a lot of them. So Christian Kirk is a fairly safe player, I think. Michael Pittman is a risky player, but he certainly has a lot of upside. He's very talented and on an offense that doesn't have a ton of competition. Other than that, there's not any guys who I'm looking to draft right now at the wide receiver position. I know we already have a super, super good tight end, but I want to have a backup tight end because first of all, he can always go down. And second of all, he has a bye week, so I'm going to need a backup tight end. And there's so much value, but there are there is so much value that I'd rather wait until at least the 12th or preferably 13th round to draft my backup tight end because all of these guys here, except for Austin Hooper, I absolutely love. So we're going to wait on that. And let's take a look at running back. So Henderson is okay, but I doubt he's ever going to get a real workhorse load, at least for now. Pollard's just a pure handcuff to Zeke. All these other guys, I'm not really big fans of. They're all basically only going to return value if an injury happens. So let's look at quarterback. We have Drew Locke. We have Big Ben, Daniel Jones. Those are the guys that I'm looking at. Drew Locke, he has a ton of weapons, but they might be a run first team. They have such a solid running back core with Melvin Gordon, with Philip Lindsay, and with Royce Freeman, who might end up getting traded, but we'll see what happens there. So they might be a run first team. Big Ben, his only risk is getting injured again, but this is an injury that should not affect him. It's an injury that happens a lot more in baseball. And just looking at how he's been treating himself and how much time he's had to recover, it shouldn't be an issue this season. And even if it is, we might draft a backup quarterback just because of that slight risk. So especially because there's not a ton of value here at running back, wide receiver, or tight end, maybe I'll even draft a backup quarterback with our next pick. Let's take a look at our roster. So we have three more bench spots. I certainly think that considering how happy I am with my running backs and wide receivers and starting tight end, I think I might just take a backup quarterback just because why not? There's not that much value left at running back or wide receiver. So we might take a backup quarterback, but for now, Big Ben, solid player, going to be on a great offense. Very happy with that. Then two more defenses go. In fact, their division rivals, AFC North, Baltimore defense and Pittsburgh defense both go. Jamison Crowder goes, Christian Kirk goes, both safe players with not a ton of upside unless an injury happens to DeAndre Hopkins. Then Christian Kirk has some upside, but we're not going to rely on an injury. So other than that, at wide receiver, still not a ton of value. Yes, Pittman is solid, but I'm completely fine with Michael Gallup, Marvin Jones, Devontae Parker, and Terry McLaurin for sure. Other than that, maybe I'll take a shot on Rieger, Rieger, Rager, however you pronounce it. The rookie that the Eagles drafted, you know who I'm talking about. That guy, he might be worth it, but he'll be there by my next pick probably. And at running back, there's just no value there. Backup tight end, I can easily get someone by my next pick. So at this point, why not take my backup quarterback? I think Daniel Jones is a pretty safe player. He was solid last season and he has one more year of experience under his belt going into this season than he did last season. And he has some solid weapons. So I'm going to go with him here. I think he's a good player and he has some weapons around him for sure. Noah Fant goes, Chicago defense goes, Justin Jefferson, Austin Hooper, Drew Locke, Anthony Miller, Henderson, New England defense, John Brown, Tony Pollard, Michael Pittman, the rookie, Preston Williams, Philip Rivers, Justin Jackson, LA Chargers defense, 
Chase Edmonds, Sammy Watkins, and Deshaun Jackson. So, what did I say? Rieger, Rager, however you pronounce it, I think he'd be there by my next pick. And sure enough, he was. So, I mean, we might as well look at running back, but Antonio Gibson, Anthony McFarland, all of them basically relying on injury. Same with A.J. Dillon. None of them are worth it. Jalen Rieger, Rager, he can be solid no matter what happens. There does not need to be an injury for him to return value. So let's go with him right there. After I take him, Antonio Gibson, Duke Johnson, Jimmy Garoppolo, and Sterling Shepard both go. Now, at this point, we have three more picks. Two of them are going to go towards our kicker and defense. One of them is our backup tight end. So we have a solid tight end who's pretty safe, right? Mark Andrews is a very safe player. So it might be worth it to take a fairly high risk, high reward tight end because we could always trade him away. Of course, this is a mock draft, so we're not actually going to make a trade. But this mock draft is to assume that it was a real draft. We could draft a tight end that has a lot of potential and if he reaches that potential, we could always, always trade him and get some value at wide receiver or quarterback. So I think that Jaseki and Hawkinson have the most potential. And even though Detroit offense should be better than Miami's offense, I do think that Jaseki does not have as much competition around him. Preston Williams is coming off of a torn ACL mid-season. I don't think he's going to be that productive Devontae Parker's there, but that's about the only solid receiver on that team. Hawkinson has to compete with, obviously, DeAndre Swift and Carrion Johnson for targets, who are both solid, and Marvin Jones and Kenny Galladay, and that's a little too much competition. We already have Devontae Parker, but there was a study done, and it found that anytime you're stacking two players on the same team, pretty much no matter what their position is, it will always increase your chance of winning your fantasy league. So we're going to take Jaseki here. A lot of potential for sure. And if he doesn't reach that potential, no worries. We can drop him and pick up Dallas Goder, who I absolutely love. Then Brandon Ayuk goes, followed by Brashad Perriman, Anthony McFarlane, Joe Burrow. As you can tell, this is just the rookie round, basically. Justin Tucker, Butker, Denver defense, Hawkinson, Jarwin, Minnesota defense, Greg Zerline, Will Lutz, Green Bay defense, Ryan Tannehill, Robbie Gould, Young Hoku, Zane Gonzalez, and Seattle defense. So pretty much almost all either tight ends, defenses, kickers, or rookies. So at this point, we're just getting a kicker and a defense. Defenses are a little easier to predict, I guess. So let's go with the defense. Looking at this, I think the best option is definitely Tennessee because even though they have a decent offense, they're not in a great division and their offense is a very slow-paced offense. They love to ground and pound. They give the rock to Derrick Henry. That's all they ever want to do. They take long drives and they have a solid defense as well. So their opponents are not going to be scoring a ton. So let's take Tennessee defense right there. Fairbairn goes, Prater goes, Mike Williams goes, Boston Scott goes. It's time for our kicker who is going to win us our fantasy league, right? That's the attitude that we want to have. So at this point, it's just choosing some solid offenses that aren't too good and that are going to be fast paced. So I like Jake Elliott. I like Matt Gay. It's really between Jake Elliott and Matt Gay at this point. It doesn't matter who you take. But you know what? Steven Goskowski always produced under Tom Brady. So why wouldn't Matt Gay under Tom Brady? So we'll take Matt Gay. And then after him, Jake Elliott, Hunter Renfro, the wide receiver with the least amount of upside that is even draftable, but who is just a guy that you can fill in to be your wide receiver to or flex when all of your other players have injuries or buys. So... Whatever, him in the last round, not bad. Carlos Hyde, Johnu Smith, Eric Ebron, those tight ends are all good for being drafted in the 15th round. A.J. Dillon, Alshon Jeffrey, Golden Tate, and Mr. Irrelevant, 
Brandon McManus. So let's take a look at our team one last time. At quarterback, we have Big Ben, who could easily be a top five quarterback. But yes, if he goes down, we always have Daniel Jones to back him up. So no worries there. Running back, Saquon Barkley, CEH, and who will be in our flex, but who still can play running back, obviously. Chris Carson, love that depth right there. And we also have a little more depth with James White there to be a very safe player, but who can fill in. We have four running backs. It's not as much as I normally take, but we got three running backs in the first three rounds, so there's not as much need to stack up on running backs. And because we didn't draft too many wide receivers in the early rounds, we kind of stacked up on them in the mid and late rounds. And if we need another running back, we can always trade for one. So no worries there. At wide receiver, Terry McLaurin, Devontae Parker. We also have Michael Gallup, Marvin Jones, and Jalen Rieger. So I like all those players. None of them are true wide receiver ones. At least I'm not projecting them to be. But I think McLaurin and Parker are solid wide receiver twos. And I think the same thing with Michael Gallup. And Marvin Jones has the potential to be just as Jalen Rieger has. Although Marvin Jones has a little more of a floor than Rieger does because Rieger is a rookie. So there is always that. At tight end, we have one of the best there is, Mark Andrews. And to back him up, we have Mike Giusecki, who I absolutely love. I think in a regular year with not a ton of tight ends, Giusecki would be a top eight tight end drafted for sure. But because there's so many now, he fell to me in the 13th round, so I absolutely love that. Then kicker and defense, Matt Gay, who is on a Tom Brady-led offense. Steven Goskowski always did well under a Tom Brady-led offense, so why wouldn't Matt Gay? He's a strong leg, and this offense is going to be great, and they're going to be very fast-paced, but they're not going to be so phenomenal that they're just scoring touchdowns on every single possession. Titans defense, only reason I took them is because they are a decent defense and they're in a pretty weak division and their offense is very slow paced. So their opponents, even if they have good offenses, they're not going to have a ton of possessions. So that's just going to make it better for Tennessee Titans defense and special teams. So that is my team, everyone. Let me know in the comments below what you would rank this team out of 10. Is it a one out of 10? Is it 10 out of 10? What is it? And let me know what you think you would have done different and what picks you think I should have went with someone else and let me know who that someone else is that you would have taken. But with all that being said, I appreciate all of you guys staying until the very end of this video. If you are still watching, clearly you enjoyed this video. So remember, like I said before, an important video that you have to watch is the Debo Samuel fantasy football impact on not only him, but also, everyone else on the 49ers, definitely watch that. I also have more mock drafts available on my channel. Definitely go check those out. But before you do, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe so you can get more content and just show your appreciation for this video that I took quite a bit of time to record and edit. So thank you guys so much, and I will see you next time. Peace.